It's winter, 1939. In the frigid dark of northern Europe, a battle raged between David and Goliath. Finland, a tiny, brand-new nation, stood toe-to-toe with the USSR, the big red dog of the east. The freezing, bitter snow whips across the collar tundra as two Russian officers huddle round together, trying to light a cigarette. A sniper lays prone on the ridge nearby, keeping watch across the silent, icy wasteland ahead of him. It's been quiet today, remarked the taller soldier. The shorter man nodded absentmindedly, still trying to get his match to light. The Finnish winter was known for its ferocity, and even for the Russians who were used to this temperature, the constant darkness was unnerving. Finally, the match catches, and the two officers quickly cup their hands around the flame and light the cigarettes. What are we, the third replacement this week? That damn sniper has trapped us in this wasteland. The men have started calling him the White Death, said the smaller man, taking a drag. It is not good for morale. Comrade Stalin does not like delays. Well, if Comrade Stalin would send us a few more tanks, we could blast our way through and be having lunch in Helsinki by the end of this week. The other man said, grinning, taking a deep drag just as the cigarette went out. Suka it. this damn weather. Have you got another match? That was my last. The short one turned to the sniper. Vasily, do you have a match? The sniper turned his head but didn't respond. Come on, man, the match. It's near sunset. There's no one there. Reluctantly, the sniper turned around, reached into his jacket pocket and rose to his feet. By your own da- A shot rang out, echoing against the cliffs ahead. Immediately, both officers ducked down and saw their sniper fall lifelessly on the ground in front of them. The bullet had gone right through his cheek, a near-perfect shot. On the other side of the icy tundra, a Finnish sharpshooter watched the man fall. He instinctively reloaded, but there was no need. Even from this distance, he knew it was a clean kill. He had waited hours for the shot, lying motionless in the negative 40 degrees Celsius winter, barely breathing, until suddenly a glint of reflection from the other man's sniper scope had given him away. He silently packed up his kit and made his way back to the barracks, wondering about his kill count. 150 Russians? 200? More? You're listening to Anthology of Heroes, the podcast that takes you through the life of national heroes from every country of the world. And this is the story of the deadliest sniper in the history of warfare, a man who gave all he could in the defense of his nation and asked nothing in return. In his home country of Finland, he's called Simo Hauha, but to the Russians, he was Balea Smirt. The White Death. There's a particular song by one of my favourite bands, Sabaton. They've got a bit that goes like this. Quote, Russians on the route to ruin. Kremlin's more than certain to win. Sent away an army to the west. Blizzard reigned, the ground were chosen. Snow is deep and hell is frozen. Stalin were too eager to invade. It's a song called Talvisota, which in Finnish means Winter War. The Winter War of the 1940s is one that always seems to be pushed to the back pages of history, overshadowed by World War II, which started soon after. But it's a story that deserves to be told. It's full of tales of true heroism, the coming together of a very new nation for a common goal to preserve their freedom and way of life against an antagonistic and warmongering neighbour. Without these men and women, perhaps there would be no Finland today. While our focus for this episode will be on one man, the mateship and camaraderie could just as easily be applied to any of the other Finns who fought desperately outnumbered with virtually no air support or anti-tank guns, all on their own. These are their stories. As the dusky medieval period gave way to the Enlightened Era, The country we now call Finland was pulled back and forth between the Swedish Empire in the west and the Russian Empire in the east. But whichever empire they belonged to, there was always a separate Finnish identity that persisted. The huge dark forests and tons of lakes meant people could live undisturbed despite whatever was happening in the outside world. In 1917, the newly installed communist government of Russia issued a decree that said all peoples living in the Russian Empire were free to self-govern if they wished. The Finns didn't need to be told twice, and by late 1917, the nation of Finland was born. A nasty civil war followed soon afterwards, 
at this point in history, the world was kind of in a bit of communist fever and Finland was no exception. So after this short but very nasty civil war, the communists lost out and Finland emerged as a wobbly democratic republic, much to the disappointment of Russia. Over the next few decades, the government and its people began to repair the rift that had grown between the two factions of the civil war. Whether you were a communist or a republican in the past, it was irrelevant. Now you were just Finnish. And it was into this new and healing nation that Simo Hawa was born. Simo was born in the rather rural part of southeast Finland, east of the capital of Helsinki, an area that's now part of Russia. He grew up as one of eight children and spent the majority of his life tending to chores around the farm. Simo's recollection of his childhood was a happy one. During the day, boys tended to the animals and the girls knitted clothes or prepared the meals. By night, Simo's mother would sing psalms to the kids around an open fire. Around the farm, there was always something that needed to be done, and this suited Simo fine. He was the type of kid that liked to be busy, doing things, mending things, teaching other things, and between all this, he didn't really have that much spare time. But with the spare time he did have, he really loved hunting. Simo was a natural shooter. Trained by his father, he was taught to try and think and act like the animal he was hunting, imagining he was the fox or the moose. As he grew, Simo, like most of his countrymen, became used to the extreme weather patterns of his country, going from around 18 hours of sunlight in the summer to five in winter. Not only that, but the winters were cold. In Simo's village, minus 35 degrees Celsius days were not uncommon. Growing up in this kind of place meant you had to be pretty hardy, and Simo himself said that his greatest advantage he had was a sound body and mind. You could say that he was very... Uh, at peace with himself and in tune with the raw beauty of his country. As he grew into his teens, Simo developed into a modest and friendly young guy. Nicknamed Samuna by his mates, he was fairly short with a friendly grin and a clean cut of dark brown hair. His shooting too, which was already wickedly accurate, improved even further. In his first shooting competition that he entered on a whim, he won easily, scoring 93 out of 100 points. And after this, he easily blitzed through tournament after tournament, always taking first prize. But he never let it get to his head. Despite being the local legend, he never liked to draw attention to himself. In the photos from his rifle club, Simo's always at the back, tucking himself away, never wanting to hog the limelight. Simo had decided early in his life that a career in academia wasn't for him. At 19 years old, he started his mandatory military service, but chances are he probably would have gone down this path anyway. He served in the bicycle battalion, and yes, that's a real thing, and stunned his commanding officer by hitting a target at 150 metres away, 16 times in a minute, demonstrating not only a wickedly accurate eye for aim, but also very fast fingers when it came to reloading a bolt-action rifle. On that note, it's worth talking about the gun that was favoured by Simo. He felt most comfortable with a Moisen Nagant M2830, a Russian-made bolt-action rifle. This was kind of standard issue for the civil guard that Simo served in, so it was the one he would have had the most practice with. Each gun has its own quirks, advantages and drawbacks, and as Simo himself said, it's vital for the weapon owner to understand these if he wishes to use it at its maximum effectiveness. Even guns of the same model could behave differently from each other depending on how it was cared for, cleaned, or if any modifications had been done to it. To this end, for a person like Simo, his weapon was very much his own. He cleaned it before and after every mission. He knew every bump, nick or scratch across its sleek birchwood body. It might surprise you to know that he didn't use a scope of any kind, preferring, or I suppose becoming comfortable, using the iron sights instead. An iron sight is the metal alignment that marks the top of the gun barrel. Almost every gun from pistol to RPG will have something similar to assist with aiming. But these are quite rudimentary things. There's no magnification lenses whatsoever. Glass lenses were harder to acquire at this point in history. Not to mention they took longer to set up, were prone to breakage and frosting over in the freezing Finnish winters. For Simo, this really wasn't worth the trade-off. So, fun fact, the most famous sniper of all time didn't use a scope of any kind. Simo's life on the farm in his small town with his friends and family was to what many of us would consider idyllic living. But you could not say the same for the rest of the world. Just east of Simo's town lay the borders of the Soviet Union, the big red dog of the east. 
From a global standing, Finland, like other countries of Scandinavia, had declared themselves neutral in the upcoming conflict that seemed to be drawing every other country in. World War I, the so-called war to end all wars, had only just recently wrapped up. But with the harsh conditions that had been imposed on Germany, there was widespread unhappiness among the population. Battle lines were drawn all across Europe for an upcoming conflict. After agreeing to release Finland as its own country, the Soviet Union had put together a non-aggression pact with Finland. But since the initial signing, the paranoid ruler of the Soviet Union had become nervous that Finland could be used as a launching pad for an invasion into its capital, Leningrad, which was very, very close to the Finnish border. The leader of the USSR, Joseph Stalin, was a brutal and very paranoid man, and both of these traits worsened as he aged. I'm sure most of you will know all about him, so I'll spare the introduction, but summarised, he rose to power by assassinating his rivals. He's not actually Russian, but Georgian. Stalin wasn't his real name. He picked it, and it means man of steel. His policies caused suffering and deaths in the tens of millions, and he remains one of history's biggest mass murderers. Oh, and there's also speculation he tried to create an army of half-men, half-monkey hybrids. Anyway, despite the non-aggression pact he had already signed, Stalin sent over a diplomat to try and strong-arm a few islands away from Finland. The meeting went something along the lines of, hey, we're concerned that Finland could be used by Western powers to invade the Soviet Union before our army of monkey man soldiers has been created. Finland assured the ambassadors that the Finns would remain neutral. No one would be using its land for anything except for them. The Russian ambassador suggested that maybe Finland could just toss them a couple of islands, you know, as a sign of good faith. The Finnish ambassadors, probably looking at a map of the globe and noticing that Russia already owned about a quarter of it, told them that wasn't going to happen. The two ambassadors left the meeting cordially, but both seemed to understand conflict was now inevitable. Finland's military was a very rudimentary thing, and the government wasn't ignorant to this. But with little money and an unreliable supply line, the training for troops was stripped back to the core fundamentals basic survival techniques, shooting, and, crucially, skiing. From all over the icy archipelago, conscripts drifted into service. Very few of them had proper uniforms and instead arrived in warm, insulated civilian clothes. If they had a rifle, they bought it with them. Otherwise, they were at the mercy of whatever was floating around in the armory. Veterans of their recent civil war were quickly pushed into officer roles as the government scrambled to mobilise the population. Communists found themselves in the training yard hammering out push-ups alongside Republicans, putting their differences aside for a common goal to defend their fledgling country. Add in a sprinkling of foreign volunteers and a small group of German-trained elite forces, and that was the army of Finland. On an interesting side note, Christopher Lee, perhaps the most interesting man of the world who played Saruman in Lord of the Rings, was actually one of these volunteers but never ended up seeing combat. Over in Russia, Stalin was in a foul mood. He was not used to being told no, and usually before someone had the gall to dare defy him, his secret police had them killed before the thought even entered their mind. This tiny country, no, this territory, dared to defy him? Stalin needed a casus belli, a a reason to put these arrogant Finns in their place. But due to the regrettable non-aggression pact he himself had signed, he had to get creative. On the 26th of November 1993, a false flag attack took place. A false flag attack, for anyone unsure, is a military move designed to hide or cast doubt on the real instigator of the attack. In this case, Stalin had a small Soviet military outpost shelled. A few Russian soldiers were killed and Finland was blamed. Finland, of course, denied responsibility and suggested the idea of a joint investigation Together, the two neighbours could come together and find out who had orchestrated such a horrid act. Interestingly, the non-aggression pact had a clause to cover an event like this, which was exactly what the Finns had suggested, a joint investigation. But Stalin didn't want to hear it. He had his reason, however flimsy. The Reds were a-coming. But first, a quick note from one of our friends of the show. Hi there. Sorry to interrupt, but I have a funny feeling that you might want to know about history podcasts. It just so happens I host a show called History of Asia. It gives you a broad overview, focusing on the stuff that still matters. I think it's hard to understand why any historical event remains relevant, unless you know what happens after. Therefore, History of Asia starts off in the present. Then I explain how it got to that point by delving ever deeper into the past. 
If you'd like to join me on this journey, check out History of Asia by Christoph Arts. Stalin went into the war with a very in-and-out, 20-minute adventure kind of view. He did not think the war would be hard or long. He was confident that the Red Army would steamroll through Finland. He was so sure of this victory that he double-checked his officers were clear about the borders between Finland and Sweden, as he didn't want them to accidentally push all the way into Stockholm after they had finished off Finland. So why the overconfidence? Simply put, it was because his officers never disagreed with them. They knew Stalin didn't like to be questioned. In fact, he had just wrapped up a two-year-long purge of anyone who could possibly be a threat to him. All dictators are paranoid, but Stalin was something else. The estimates for this purge sit around one million people. Yes, one million. From the lowliest peasant to the most decorated military general, none were safe from the creeping claws of the man of steel and his secret police. There were no trials, no charges, just rumours, whispers, or sideways glances. French historian Stephanie Cotois states that during the Great Terror, the following army ranks were decimated by Stalin. Three of five four-star generals, 13 of 15 army commanders, eight of nine admirals, 50 of 57 army corps commanders, and many, many more rank-and-file troops. The complete gutting of some of Russia's best military minds left Stalin with a bunch of groveling flatterers with minimal military skill. Even those that perhaps had a sound military mind knew better than to disagree or question the worth of an order from Stalin, lest they and their families disappear one night. On paper, it's very easy to see why Stalin would assume a quick victory. The sheer number of the men the USSR could call upon dwarfed that of Finland, and that's saying nothing of the advantages they held in air, support and artillery. But the plucky Finnish defenders had something that wasn't easily quantifiable, something that the Soviets lacked from the onset spirit, or said differently, morale. You see, the Soviet troops were poorly trained, poorly led, poorly supplied, poorly organised, oh, and poorly dressed. The Russian horde lurched across the border in olive-coloured khaki uniforms. Khaki. During the harshest winter on record, in one of the coldest places on earth, the Finns were waiting for them. Warm and camouflaged in their white-painted civilian clothing, they were almost invisible, and when they were sighted, they quickly chucked on a pair of skis and disappeared into the forest. As the Winter War began, Simo started off as a machine gunner. He and a small team were tasked with defending a region called Kola, not all that far from where Simo's home village was. The Russian advance was initially slow. This part of Finland had virtually no roads, just patchy forests, and the snow could be deeper than a man was tall. Simo and a few men were given the task of disrupting Russian communications by cutting telephone lines. Despite being under heavy fire, Simo recalls that he was calm the entire time. This kind of fatalistic approach to danger seemed to be natural for Simo, but probably really helped calm other jittery soldiers who were stationed with him. The overall Finnish strategy for the war was one of defence in depth. Slow withdrawal back to a defensive line that was named the Mannerheim Line after Baron Mannerheim, an esteemed Finnish military commander. Once they were pushed all the way back to the line, hopefully some of the Western powers would come to their aid and not allow their burgeoning democracy to be swallowed up by communism, which the West despised so much. As more and more Russians poured across the border, the fighting began to heat up. Many of the Finnish divisions were mainly left to their own devices. With no centralised support, they had to make do with whatever they could find many groups began to rely on the ammunition they'd nabbed from the Russians they'd killed. One of the groups was led by a man named Arne Jutlalien, who had seen military action before fighting in the French Foreign Legion. Jutlalien was a stone-cold badass. This guy had returned from the French Foreign Legion, which was already no picnic, and had spent the last few years battling the Berber tribes of Morocco, apparently giving them such a shellacking that his boys began to call him the Terror of Morocco which ended up sticking. Jutlanian was known to keep a cool head in battle, even under extreme circumstances. A story I found online but couldn't confirm says that to calm the nerves of his men, he took a chair and sat on it in the line of fire, turning to his men behind him and asking, what were you worried about? Whether or not this particular story is true, the Finnish officer corps was brimming with these talented foreign-trained leaders who had returned from home with the express mission of defending their country 
Jutlanian was the first to notice that Simo had a wickedly sharp aim and that the man of this quality was wasted as a machine gunner. As Simo and his friends scrambled to defend the borders, the rest of the world looked on with disdain at Stalin's invasion. The League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations of today, called the war illegal and actually booted the USSR out of the organisation. Many countries pledged to support Finland, but apart from a few volunteers from Sweden, none came forth with any real numbers. Inside the USSR, propaganda bled through the radio waves, educating its civilian population that the bombing runs they were subjecting Finland to were actually just food drops and humanitarian aid. The fascist-leaning Finns were starving their population. Hmm, yeah, okay. The Finns seemed to enjoy this type of story and nicknamed the bombs Molotov Bread Baskets, after the Russian ambassador Vyacheslav Molotov. And continuing the joke in an act of the typical bone-dry sense of humour that's well known to the Scandinavian countries, the Finnish army named their new incendiary weapon the Molotov Cocktail, an appropriate drink to go with the food that their dear friend Mr Molotov had sent them. The Molotov cocktail was easy to make, a glass bottle, a rag, gasoline and a match. And once a local alcohol producer began to send Molotov kits to the front line, the men had finally something to throw back at the red tanks. It was crude, but it worked. The tanks of this era were not sealed like the ones of today. Once the bottle shattered on the outside of the tank, the fiery liquid could leak into any number of ventilation or exhaust holes, burning the crew inside or damaging the equipment. This new weapon, the Molotov cocktail, was to be one of the first of many ingenious low-tech inventions that the Finns would come up with over the course of the war. Not long after being pulled off machine gun duty, Simo was selected for his first assignment by the Terror of Morocco. He was to take out a Russian sniper that had killed three platoon leaders and one courier. The enemy sniper had proved himself a crack shot, and his presence was a continual danger to the troops, not to mention slowing down communication. Simo told his commander simply, I will do my best, and made his way out to the general area where the Russian was thought to be. Completely covered in snow-white camouflage with four or five layers of clothing to keep warm, with a white bandage even covering the wooden stock of his rifle, Simo would have been near invisible, but he didn't want to take any chances. Simo would usually pat out the area around his rifle stock to avoid the snow being disturbed and attracting attention. He was even known to keep a mouthful of snow so his breath would not be noticed by the enemy. As the meagre hours of daylight began to draw to a close, Simo had been laying in the same position for hours, staring intently through his tiny iron sight, scanning the forest for any disturbances. Then, out of nowhere, he saw it. A tiny flicker of reflection from a rifle scope. Lining up his sights, Simo took a deep breath, and as the Russian rose from his hiding place, Simo took his shot. One bullet was all it took. Yutlanian was impressed with Simo's shot, but perhaps he had just got lucky. Soon after, Simo and his commander spoke about another troubling enemy sniper. Hidden somewhere in the tree line, this man had been taking out troops from their front lines. He must have been quite a shot as well, because the forest was around 400 metres away. Jutlanian had some experience with a sniper and was frustrated that he couldn't manage to take out the man himself. Simo suggested that maybe he would have better luck. With his own unscoped rifle, Simo's trained eyes meticulously scanned the tree lines with the help of a spotter. A few hours later he saw him, a tiny mound of snow above a boulder, looking slightly out of place. Simo pulled the trigger. 400 metres away, the Russian sniper fell dead. Once again, a single shot was all that was required. As Simo's special missions carried on, his reputation grew. The Russians, furious at this one sniper sapping morale and slowing their advancement, began to refer to him as Balea Smirt, or the White Death in English. Simo began to kill many, many Russians per day. He usually packed around 50 or 60 shots of ammunition when heading out for the morning. And try as they might, the Reds' snipers just couldn't manage to find him. Though his reputation had grown, his ego didn't. He never got careless and always took the same preparations to conceal himself. One fateful day after losing tens of men to the White Death, the Russian officers furiously called down an artillery strike on the surrounding forest, going with the spray and pray approach where precision had failed them. Mortars and bombs rained from the sky as Simo kept his head down. Once the shelling was over, 
He noticed a bit of his outer cloak was smouldering, but apart from that, he was uninjured. While the Magic Sniper, as other Finnish troops had dubbed him, escaped a lucky break, things were getting harder and harder for his friends on the front lines. Thousands upon thousands of Russian troops had now stamped down the powdery snow, creating highways for their tanks to come into the front line. Men like Yutlanian and others were thinking on their feet, and a common strategy that they came together and championed was moti. The word moti in Finnish terms means something like a small chunk of wood, one that has been split apart from the main tree. So this should give you a pretty clear idea about what was involved. Once the tanks and their escorts began snaking through the dark forests over a single lane road of packed snow, Finnish troops would break isolated chunks away from the column. Once they had the moti surrounded, the tanks were taken out with whatever was available. Molotov cocktails were preferred, but something as rudimentary as a wooden log could be jammed in the treads of the tank if the men could get close enough. By the time reinforcements had arrived for the isolated Russian moti, the Finns would have jumped on their skis and disappeared, and the wrecked tank would take hours to clear away. All down the snaking Russian front, scenes like this unfolded. Little microchasms that are hard to be classified into X or Y battle, but collectively make up the defiant struggle from everyday people. Office workers, bankers, street sweepers, these men were not full-time soldiers. And for those listening with no military training like myself, if your government told you to report to the harshest terrain in your country and hold off an army that literally dwarfed yours, what would you say? Honestly, these fins were made of hard stuff. Even so, the Russians were making headway. Slowly but surely, they were being pushed towards their last line of defence, the Mannerheim line. Stalin's propaganda built up this as another Maginot line, the famous French defences that were designed to hold back Germany. But by Finnish soldiers' own admission, the Mannerheim line was not much more than a dugout trench and a few hastily built bunkers. With a grim sense of realism, the terror of Morocco was questioned by his commander. Castalco Cola? Will Cola hold? Without missing a beat, the same Finnish sense of humour. The commander replied coolly, Cola will hold, before adding dryly, unless the order is to run away, in reference to an order that they'd previously been given and disregarded. The phrase Cola Kesta would become a rallying cry for men like Simo, and in a way embodied the spirit of the Winter War. Some might even say the birth of Finnish nationalism. No longer was the man serving beside you a communist or a republican. He was a Finn, like you and all others. At the end of an exhausting day, back in the mess hall of the barracks, one of the Finns joked to his friends through a grin, They are so many, and our country is so small. Where will we bury them all? (laughs) With his fame growing, soon the magic sniper was nominated for an award. For the first time in months, he was allowed a kind of holiday from the front lines. Transported to the Finnish military HQ, Simo Haya was presented with an honorary rifle gifted by a Swedish businessman. The White Death, shy but undeniably proud, was presented with the gun during a ceremony. Quote, 219 enemies shot dead with a rifle, and the same number with a submachine gun shows what a determined Finnish man with sharp eyes and a steady hand can do. End quote. That was a quote from the man giving him the rifle, not Simo himself. We've got a great photo of this ceremony uh, with Simo holding his fancy new rifle on our Instagram account. Check it out. After the ceremony, and for the first time in months, Simo slept inside in a real bed. With a belly full of Finnish food and imported wine, he slept like a log. But the peace and tranquility would not last long. By the time he was back at the front, things had been cranked up to 11. Like a human sea, the Russians poured across the borders and the multi tactics that had kept the Finns going were becoming less effective. Even when they isolated a group, there were now so many Russians that what good did isolating them do even if the group was still too big to take on? Simo's rifle was popping off non-stop. Seriously, by this point, this guy had almost taken down an entire battalion by himself. To give you an idea of comparative strengths, the Russians were firing off around thirty-five to 40,000 shells a day. The Finns were firing off 1,000. Simo remembers the Christmas of that year saying, quote, The Russians did not give us peace, even during Christmas, but God was close to us. We sang psalms. Desperate to clear out the white death, the Russians bring in a periscope and put a price on Simo's head. Picture like a periscope for a submarine, but small enough to be used as a kind of handheld tool by the infantry. Needless to say, these weren't too easy to come by in the front. 
Well, Simo sees the periscope looking for him and smashes it with a direct hit. As soon as he did, an artillery barrage rained down his position. It's easy to see Simo at this time sprinting from one foxhole to the other, rifle in hand. But it wasn't over. Somehow, they bring in another, a more basic periscope, which Simo, with another shot, shatters as well. But this kind of ferocity could not continue. As Captain Yutlanian had promised, Kola still held, but for how long? By this point in the war, Finland was asking, begging more like, their closest ally, Sweden, a nation that shared long-running cultural ties to Finland for help. The Swedish public too was in support. Finland was like their little brother and he was taking a hell of a beating. Sweden allowed private citizens to enlist and allowed supplies to pass through its territory but would not intervene officially. Meanwhile, Stalin wanted this whole embarrassing campaign to come to an end. Since the beginning of the war, he had more than adjusted his expectations for the outcome. On the 6th of March, the magic sniper's luck ran out. Russians poured over the border in record numbers. There was no need for accuracy in a battle like this. Throwing his trusty M2830 aside, Simo was given command of a squad. In the ensuing battle, he estimated he killed around 40 men, but no matter how many he fell, the ranks just seemed to refill like magic. The Finnish lines too began to fracture, but Simo held on as ordered to. And from out of nowhere, he heard a sound. Quote, I only heard a suppressing sound and I knew immediately that I was hit. I started to get this bright tunnel vision that went closer and further back and forth. End quote. Everything went black. Simo had been hit in the jaw with an explosive bullet. An explosive bullet is similar to a normal round, but packed with an incendiary charge. When the bullet makes impact, it's almost as if a, a small grenade goes off. If you think this sounds nasty and that it probably shouldn't be allowed in war, you'd be right. The 1868 St. Petersburg Declaration declared that this caused unnecessary suffering and was henceforth banned in all forms of warfare. But this didn't matter to Stalin. The man murdered scores of Russians before his morning coffee. What did he care for international laws? Simo's face was destroyed by the impact. Delirious and in shock, he crawled a few metres to one of his friends who attempted to bandage his face. The damage was so severe, though, that the man didn't even know where to start. He didn't want to make it worse. Remember, these are not NCOs. These are frontline troops, and all of them said that this, this was the worst thing they'd ever seen. Seema recalls, quote, After some time, I woke up as one of our boys were turning me around by my arm, twisting me into a better position to give me first aid. I felt my mouth full of bone fragments and blood. The bullet had entered through my upper lip and punctured my cheek. End quote. After this moment, Simo lost consciousness and fell into a coma. He woke up a little over a week later. The war was over. When he woke up in the field hospital, what he didn't know was how he got back from the front. There's quite a few different variations of the story for whoever you ask, but the most common ones say that he was dragged back from the front lines and put onto a dog sled and sent to a field hospital. But once the medic there saw the state of his face, he declared that he was dead, or as good as. He was placed in a pile of dead Finnish soldiers that were waiting to be buried. But when Simo's platoon leader pulled back and began their strategic retreat, he called out that they were not leaving until they found Simo. A soldier or nurse, depending on sources, noticed a single foot twitching in a pile of dead bodies. It was Simo's. Barely clinging on to life, he was put on another dog sled while his friends patted out his destroyed face with cotton and bandages. Once he got to the main hospital, he was barely alive. Doctors just managed to stabilise him but made no guarantees he would live. As the magic sniper lay comatosed in a field hospital, the armistice was agreed, a treaty was signed. Stalin's terms were moderate considering his gains. The main condition was that 8% of Finnish territory was ceded to Russia, including much of Finland's industrial heartland. The Finnish cabinet knew they had no options left, but still considered this unfair. The Prime Minister, Kyosti Kalio, signed it bitterly. As he did so, he famously spat, May the hand wither which is forced to sign such a paper, end quote. A few months later, he had a stroke and his writing hand was paralysed. The Russians too were not thrilled by the treaty. One of the generals said darkly, quote, 
we have won just about enough ground to bury our dead, end quote. The total casualty for Stalin's winter hell was something around 350,000 for Russia and 70,000 for the Finns. But the war didn't just cost Russia men and money. Russian diplomatic reputations suffered all across the globe as they were labelled warmongers. Hitler, observing how Russia struggled against such a tiny nation, famously quipped, quote, All one needs to do is kick in the door and the whole rotten structure would fall in, end quote. It seems like many of his expectations for his later invasion of Russia were based on his observations of this war. The White Death, the magic sniper of the Winter War, had 26 different surgeries. A good chunk of bone was taken from his hip to replace what he lost to the explosion in his jaw. He recovered gradually, but would carry around the scars of cholera for the rest of his life. I, I can try and describe it, but I mean, it looks like a guy who's been hit by an explosive shell, as that's what's happened. His family noted that he had two lives, one before the war and one after. Already a quiet man, Simo afterwards became a little more withdrawn. A shopkeeper who saw him regularly said he was polite and quiet and spoke with a bit of a slur. But he didn't live a lonely life. He enjoyed the company of other war veterans and many of the animals that he kept, particularly his favourite hunting dog, Killy. The honorary rifle which the Swedish businessman had given him was put to good use moose hunting in his free time. His famous M2830 lost forever somewhere on the collar front after his injury. Fifteen months after the armistice was declared, Finland, with the help of Germany and Italy, invaded Russia to try and regain some of the lost territory. Simo again volunteered for combat duty but was unfit due to his injury. But instead he served his country however he could, finding good horses that would be used as draft animals for the war. Simo Hawa would go on to lead a long and rich life he started his own farm and enjoyed raising and rearing animals until he was too old, eventually moving into a support home for disabled war veterans. And during his final years of life, he had many visitors who came and saw him regularly. All of them remarked that he kept his mind active on foreign affairs and always had a good sense of humour, stating one day that, quote, collar held, but my hip is giving up, end quote. On the 1st of April, 2002, at 96 years of age, the White Death closed his eyes for the last time, in the safety of his own bed in a country that he had been pivotal in defending. Simo's life and his legacy are inseparable from the Winter War. In typical private modesty that was part and parcel of Simo Hawa, his true kill count remained a mystery. But after his death, his personal diary revealed that number he estimated was around 500 men split between bolt-action rifle and machine gun. Considering the fairly short span of his career, barely over 100 days, this averages out to be about five per day, which is particularly impressive considering how short the daylight hours were. During his lifetime, he never really liked to talk about the kills too much. Interestingly, the personal diary also refers to the count as his, quote, sin list, which offers, I suppose, some rare insight into what this Christian man really thought about what he had done. Or this could just be more dry Scandinavian humour. Even though Simo is the most famous, countless other war veterans would have stories similar to his, stories of bravery and companionship in, in incredibly desperate times. Even though the war itself was lost, the, the Finns held out for much, much longer than anyone expected them to, and they did it alone. The effect of this was helping to unify a brand new nation As usual, nothing like a common enemy to bring people together. The Kola Front, in particular, is still famous across Finland, and the old battle lines are littered with monuments with the iconic phrase, Kola Kasta, Kola Holds. Today, I'll end this episode with a quote from Tapio Aam Saralanian, a biographer and military man who knew Simo personally, whose notes I've also drawn on heavily for this episode. Quote, Over 60 years have passed since Finland experienced the horrors of war. Those Finns still living who experienced the war generally do not like to speak about it. The younger generation cannot imagine the harsh conditions and emotional stress that they endured. They ate, slept and breathed it every day, watching their comrades fight and die so that Finland could stay independent against an enemy that was both materially and numerically superior. And in doing so, They formed an honoured chapter in Finnish history, a chapter that will never be forgotten.
Thanks again for tuning into Anthology of Heroes. My name's Elliot, and I'm the host of the show. If you've enjoyed listening, why not check us out on Instagram, where you can find all number of things related to history, show notes, uh, upcoming episodes, and just historical tidbits that I find interesting. Have a great day, and see you on the next one. A big thank you to the show's Patreons, Luke, Malcolm, Tom, and Claudia. A lot of people don't realize it, but this is a one-man show, so there's quite a bit of time that goes into producing it. I love sharing these stories, and it means a ton knowing that there's a people out there who are really enjoying them. You guys help me keep the costs down for things like web hosting, sound libraries, books, and stuff like that. If you're not a patron already, we've got some cool rewards up, like having the option to read out some quotes I use in the show. If you want to have a look, tap the link in our bio.